right, getting back to the example, you know, this is the perfect job for stick to stick because uh, this is just a mock up. It's not even a real job. They're scrapping stuff out of the scrap pile. But it's hard to get the MIG gun in. It's just a little too tight. You can't, you can't quite get it welded all the way on the inside. And if it needed to be welded all the way on the inside, then, you know, stick is the way to go. Possibly could have, uh, you know, done it with a flux cord, taken the nozzle off. However, that's a lot of trouble swapping out spools of wire. All I have to do is flip the machine on and grab a stick rod and go. And that is the convenient part about stick is it's so, you know, it's so quick to get set up. There's no swapping gas, no swapping spools of wire. You just talk, you know, you just pull out a stick, put it in the stinger, flip it on, and you go and you weld over some light rust and things like that without any issues. Today I'm using a 6011 and also a 7018 332nd AC. 7018 for welding some fuzz box. Because that's all I've got. I actually have other welding machines. I just wanted to go old school with this fuzz box just to show you what could be done with it. So this first weld was done with the 6011 I'm going to kind of figure out the best way to put the rod in the in the, uh, in the clamp here, the electrode holder. Sometimes I remember what I told you. Technically, it's referred to as an electrode, right? Not a rod. Because it does what? Just doing a really slight whip and pause and forward and back motion. A lot of people use a lot more of a whip, come out of the puddle a little bit further than that. But I want to actually, on a weld like this, I actually want to build up a little bit of a rope to it. So I'm just making a short movement. I know it's going to be kind of ugly and kind of crowned up in the middle, but that's what I would do if I had if I had to use this. Shallow, concave weld. So that ain't, that ain't all that pretty. That's for sure. Second weld on the uh, other outside. Same, same setting, same rod. A little smaller, smaller movements. Almost like little circles. You're not going to get as pretty a weld with a 6011 as you do with uh, a lot of other rods because it is a fast freeze rod. And each little movement of the rod makes a very distinct ripple. Kind of bumpy well and makes the flag a little harder to come off and whatnot. But it does dig deep, it does penetrate deep, and does burn through milk scale and rust and things like this as well. Now the inside here, I'm going to swap over to that 332nd 7018 AC. These, these rods are designed to be run on AC. Not all 7018s are. Uh, if you're using a buzz box like this, you're better off buying the uh, actual 7018 AC design. It runs a lot smoother. In fact, the other ones will kind of go out with you a lot of times, the standard 718. Unless you're using a square wave machine, in which case it probably run just fine on DC. Or actually on AC, either one. But on this rod, I've got the same setting, 120 amps. And I'm just making very subtle movements, not really intended to move it a whole lot at all. You can just drag it nice and steady. It works just fine. That rod, that's a whole lot easier. Slide comes off a whole lot easier, a whole lot smoother weld. It's very easy to get that rod down in this, uh, you know, between these two little members here, whereas the big gun wouldn't fit. Pretty much the same thing going on here. You see that my lens is taking a beating, and I thought I'd give it a try without a clear lens today on, on the uh, camera, and, uh, and that's what happened. So I got the lens scrapped out. Again, you can see the slag peels off a whole lot easier than it does with the 611. The weld looks a whole lot better also. This doesn't burn in quite as good, but you know, for, you know, for a new tool to do it so fast. Just, just depends on what you need. 611 is a lot better for going downhill or for burning through rust, and the 718 is a little better. But those are two things you can do with this uh, simple little Lincoln 225 buzz box that you can get all day long on Craigslist for $150 or $200. What else can you do with this thing? Well, 6011 really is good for things like this, where I previously welded with a 6013, had a big bed of slag going through the middle, so the ground must be welded out. And it turns out that a 6011 is pretty hot and can burn through some stuff like that. One other thing you can do is you can get, get all of some really small 1 16th diameter welding rods uh, and 
they'll cheat and they'll, even with a little buzz box like this, it goes down to 40 amps. You can say 225 down as low as 40. You can turn it down to about 40 amps. You can weld, uh, actually, you wouldn't be in trouble welding any, even the 18 gauge. But this is this is 16 gauge hot roll steel here, a little outside corner joint. And then the 6011 uh, 1A are really good for a little downhill weld like this. So if you're doing a, a fabrication on some light square tubing, it's not quite as easy as, as uh, using MIG, but it's, it's quite uh, you know, the same thing. So you can do an awful lot with even, even with a little simple old school buzz box AC welding machine. Now, if I had some in the shop today, I would have used the 7024 rod. They were designed to be used on AC. They put down a lot of metal and they put it down really, really smooth. But they're only good for welding flat and horizontal. You can't weld them downhill or vertical up while you're doing it. The 7024 has got a really heavy flux coating and a lot of iron powder in the flux. It's designed to put down a nice, heavy single pass weld or multi pass, but it, puts down a really, it would have put down a really nice, smooth weld. And this, happened to this didn't happen to have. So that's the video for today. Thanks for watching. Hey, this is Jody with another weekly video. When you're learning how to TIG weld, there's not a hundred things going wrong. There's basically about three things most of the time. When you're first learning three things that you do wrong. Basically, it's this. Too long an arc, too much torch angle, not shielding the hot end of the filler rod. And if you can cure those three things and always be thinking about those things, it's just going to make your learning process go a little quicker. So I set up a little lap joint here because a lap joint kind of shows this better than most joints. And it's 11 gauge cold ruled steel just wiped down with acetone. And I'm holding a long arc, too much angle, and I'm not, sh not shielding that hot end of the rod with the arc on. And see how things are going here. It's kind of like, it's more like gas welding than TIG welding because that, there's a huge arc plume and there's a big heated area and I am not taking advantage of the concentrated heat of TIG welding. A little closer here, but not close enough. See how that boomerang shape is forming, the C shape? The corner of the of the lap joint there is melting quickly, and the bottom is melting, but it's not, not fusing into the root of the joint. It's just bridging the gap. Contrast that with this, where I'm holding a nice tight arc, and I've got a little teardrop shape. The metal is flowing nicely into the rooted joint. Instead of balling up, the rod is feeding nicely into the puddle. That's what you want. You don't want it to blob and ball, uh, fall into the puddle. Occasionally it will here and there, but you want to be able to meter it into the puddle. That way you get something like this, nice uniform weld as opposed to this, something that looks like Fido's butt. <laughs> well, that takes care of the three things to watch for when you're learning how to pick weld. But stick around just a little while and you'll see highlights of videos posted in 2013. It's 2014 now, it's February already. What I do every year is I take all the videos I posted the previous year and put them on a DVD set, and that's how I support this video I have in mind. So it's on four discs because there's a, because there's about eight hours worth of content on there because it's a whole year's worth of, of videos. If you'd like to have this in your library, if you, if you enjoyed what, what you saw in 2013 and you'd like to have this in your, in your reference library, or if you just want to support what we're doing here at Welding Tips and Tricks, this is the way to do it. Now let's get on with the highlights. We're going to go fast. We're going to get bugs in our teeth. I'm going to try to describe a year's worth of stuff in about 11 minutes. Let's do it. I'm doing a little manual pulse TIG welding on, on some aluminum thin wall tubing here with the foot pedal. Here I'm using some thick stainless steel backing to weld a big gash in a, an aluminum part. Stainless steel backing traps the argon gas and also provides a way to cast the weld metal. Makes it a lot easier than welding without it. Here I'm using a torch switch on thick steel, using an upslope and downslope instead of a foot pedal. And the same thing, using a torch switch, using upslope and downslope to manually pulse, again on thin wall aluminum tubing. 
just using a torch switch to fill an aluminum pole like this, use light amperage and, and let that cleaning action do a little work for you before you ever puddle the metal. And then as you're filling it in and tapering off with the uh, foot pedal, keep that torch moving around to prevent leaving the crater eye. A ground for odd shaped parts, round cylinders like this or odd shaped parts where you can't get a ground clamp on. You can just use some bare braided copper wire. You can even tape this to an auto body panel and MIG weld it. Here I'm walking the cup, doing some build up on these stainless steel shafts. And also, um, we showed some straightening stainless steel shafts with a lot of build up and using a dial indicator and applying some forced cooling air to straighten the shaft. When you're doing a horizontal aluminum butt joint, you got to point that torch angle up a little bit. Sanitary stainless steel tubing. Got to get a good purge. A couple of techniques. You can do some walk in the cup. Typically, it's done without filler metal. You can either walk the cup or you can freehand. Here, I'm using a take finger. We get a little slight circular motion, about 40 amps or so on this 063 wall. Take finger slides along that nice polished stainless steel really nicely. Got to inspect that root. You want to get a good purge. Tips for doing that, 6G, 2-inch 6G pipe, hot pass is called the hot pass, but oftentimes it's the same heat or just a little bit hotter. You can mix helium with argon and make a 200 amp machine weld like a 250 amp machine. Multi-pass stainless steel welds, you got to keep them cool. Aluminum valve cover, welding a bung in aluminum valve cover, you're not always welding in a straight line. There's some techniques for adding rod from behind the puddle, settings for the machine. Vertical uphill T-joint, 3F T-joint. Techniques for that and how a TIG finger will help you slide your finger nice along that joint without smoking your pinky. Yeah, I can do that. Smoke your pinky? Outside the corner joints, amperage settings, low alloy steel TIG, 160 amps first pass, coming back over it with the second pass at slightly lower amps while maintaining an inner pass temperature of 500 degrees to prevent any kind of hardening going on in the uh, high strength, low alloy steel. No matter what we welded in 2013, we try to show unique, uh, instructive arc shots. Also, for getting better at learning, just doing a, a, a drill called the steel drill, welding left and right handed on a piece of flat bar, showed all that whole thing. Using 309 filler rod for welding steel when you don't know the composition or compares like that. Here's an example of using the rule of 33. Pulse parameters for precise bead placement on something that might be machined off, or you want to add metal in an area that was mismachined or worn, or you want to really confine that heat. Inconel 82 filler rod works really well for, for welding medium carbon steels and even tool steels. <coughs> the thing is not going to be heat treated, and you, you don't want to uh, harden weld or make it crack. Thin wall tubing, like for, used for for fabricating bicycles. Rule of 33 again, 33 pulses a second, and comparing ER70S2 filler rod to weld mold 880. Really thin wall tubing, about 030 wall techniques, filler rod, also using a big cup as well as 309 filler for certain jobs, extending that electrode way out there when you have to prevent discoloration. And just when you need to extend that electrode way out there, like welding down in a hole in a particularly tight spot. Walking the cup on some socket welds. Techniques for walking the cup using upslope, downslope, and no foot pedal. Did a couple of heavy projects like this big, big fixture. Heavy steel square tubing using spray pulse MIG parameters and a Lincoln Power MIG 350 MP. Ran through that whole project, fit up how the strong hand table worked, some oxy fuel cutting, selecting the right size tip is probably the most important thing in getting a good smooth cup, even as, as important as having a, a steady hand. Are you, I've talked about parameters on the Power MIG 350 MP using pulse spray, spray as well as short circuit using CO2 and using 9010 gas for the pulse spray parameter. How about some 115 volt or MIG. As well as some little joints and testing these. Here's some 6G pipe stacking up. And also this little technique using a forward and back type technique with some leg wire, 1 8 rod, 1 8 gap, forward and back, no side to side movement, pushing that root up through there on the bottom, making the bottom lift up the top. Then the hot pass, walking the cup, using about the same method. Really quick, quick welding, 1 8 48 
too much time to talk in the middle. Causing the sides techniques on keeping that rod pointed to the middle axis of the pipe, finishing with 50 joint out in the middle, 70, 80 degrees, and then just travel the rod. MIG welding induction conducted the same thing on the MIG, the thermal arc 252i fabricator. Vertical uphill, lap point technique. These are tracing the cone triangle techniques. And then also <coughs> cutting them on a bandsaw, polishing, putting a little acid at the bottom to reveal the weld nugget. Also, some big welding using lift arc on that fabricator. Inside fixture using the argon vacuum cast. I also did a project making a boom arm to hang a wire feeder on. I never did quite get finished. I'm still working on that. I've got some ideas here. I'm just taking a little stretch in my head to see exactly what I want to do. This is some aluminum jig using that power meter 350 AG. This was kind of a heavy fixture. Through the settings on that, work through some distortion issues, <coughs> and finally got some pretty good smooth spot settings down for the wire feed speed and snapping and splinting and things like that. And that's what the end product looks like in terms of pulling that down through. Some different settings for trying to achieve the MIG like printing look, like a Z2 fab on welding lip. Working on that a little bit, and kind of dialed that in. Also, some Padding beads with 6010 techniques there, locking hand, left hand, right hand, going right to left, two steps forward, one step back, kind of pause, flip and pause technique. Uh, that's a really good exercise for the welding tool. I built a couple of bumpers in 2013. This was a little bumper kit from JCR off road. Just using some, uh, just using the big welding, some basic tab techniques and basic welding techniques. And then also swapped over and used a, a basic Lincoln Tombstone Buzz Box from Son of the Sun with a 7014 stick rod. Try to do some basic things like people do in their garage. Talk about when uh, stick welding is better for getting in a tight spot like this where a big nozzle would need to be fit in. Again, using a 7014 1/8 rod. Um, also built a bumper from SwagOffRoad.com just using a buzz box. Nothing but a buzz box and a 7014 rod. Show you some of that coming up. This is a 7018 rod. Just swapped over to using stick welding on some of the counterweights on that big fixture that does all the work with those blocks welded in the end of the counterweights. And thought, you know, a lot of times on a Sunday afternoon when you're working in your shop and you run out of gas, you've got to get the job done. Sometimes you have to revert to stick welding. And then also some more oxy fuel cutting techniques. On that same job, there was tubing notching that had to be done. So we showed some of that as well as some plasma cutting tips and techniques for cutting the same notches, just using straight edge and drag tip. Two inch 6G stick welding cover pass. We covered that as well as the uh, TIG root pass and mud pass. This is the cover pass using 332nd Excalibur Lincoln 7018s. Tips and techniques for how to hold hand positioning for making that transition up the pipe. Right side as well as left side. This is the bumper from Swag Off Road where I built the whole bumper using that simple buzz box and 7014 rod. I did use 6011 for a little bit here and there where I had to go down in order to uh, get the tubing. This is where we have heavy tow lugs in, cranking that buzz box up good and hot with a 1 8 7014. And again, for some downhill action on the tubes, I used 6011 1 8 little buzz box. Then also did some multi pass 7018 fillet welds just to test out some MTS machines, some MIG TIG stick type inverter machines that uh, some, some folks sent me for evaluation. And use it again using that Lincoln Excalibur rod. And there were some projects along the way, like this uh, pulley cover, a pulley fan belt cover for an air compressor that was in the shop that didn't have any bars on it. There was confusion with the outside corner joints as well as the added rod. 
Now, if you think this kind of stuff would interest you, if you like to invest in yourself in DVD with about eight hours worth of welding videos on it, you can go find out more at the weldmonitorstore.com. Again, thanks for watching. He may tell about DVD, but believe me, it's not that too hard. When I tried to look at a stick welder years ago, and it's difficult. Many years ago, we had two instructors in the department that were pretty well skilled in welding. One, one of them is deceased now, but his name is Glenn Malfast, and uh, he had worked outside of school, and he was kind of uh, secretive about the work that he did, and the reason was, was because he was working for the NSA. He was able, at the time, this comes well before modern technology kind of developed into welding. He was one of the very few people that, that had the ability to make precision welds and parts where uh, the NSA was using cameras uh, aboard spacecraft in order to photograph things. They had to have precise focal lengths on the cameras. And he was the only one that was able to, at least locally, do the same kind of welding that they were interested in doing. So that's how he supported himself over the summer. Anyway, uh, one of the instructors bet him that he couldn't weld a piece of molybdenum aluminum to a very thick piece of steel or to aluminum shock. If he had a piece of uh, aluminum foil, it might have been maybe a thousandth or two thousandth thicker. He was bet that he could not weld that to a piece of aluminum plate. And okay, fine. So uh, he went over to the uh, welding booth and then <clears throat> he closed the the uh, shade or closed the, the shade on the, on the, on the welding booth. And the, the person that bet him he said, he said, oh, well, I want to see what you're doing. And he said, no. He said, if you make me the bet that I couldn't do it, the bet wasn't that I would teach you how to do it. <laughs> so, and then, and a lot of the things that you learn when you gain experience. So that, that's, that's one thing that I was pretty well taught. Did he do it though? Yes, he did. How much? He's deceased now, but he was a great welder. You'll know it. I don't know if well if you remember what this building used to look like before they remodeled it. There were um, uh, electrical connections in the building for P20 and 440 almost everywhere in the building because he liked to weld, and a lot of the electric welders went off of P20 or 440. So that's the reason why the building was constructed in 1972 with all of those provisions. timer in South Carolina and I've been using it ever since. And basically it is just making a series of U's or person E's or small loops or whatever you want to call it. Uh, in your mind's eye you just try to make the same distance loop every time. And on the lap joint uh, you watch the top of the puddle or the side of the puddle that the edge of the metal is on and you just kind of use it for a guideline and just barely let the puddle nip that corner just a little bit and that'll give you a nice straight uh, border on your weld and a better looking better looking weld because you'll be melting all that corner in and, and putting extra metal in the, the weld size. All right, the technique uh, looks something like this. You need to kind of in your mind's eye intentionally loop the same distance each time. All right, that was left and right. Just that was kind of pulling the puddle. This is going to be kind of pushing it a little bit. You can't see the puddle very well, but I just wanted to show you there's not a lot of difference in the final result. Pushing, pulling. As long as you don't get carried away with the gun angle, as long as your stick out's good and your heat's good, you can make either one work. There's a lot of argument over pushing and pulling. They both work, right? So there are some differences in, you know, some subtle differences in penetration and everything, but sometimes you have to weld right to left, sometimes you have to weld left to right. Sometimes things are in your way. Same technique. Same exact technique works both ways. There's a T joint. I'm going to do the same thing here. Now you'll notice here the stick out's a little long. That's because I was trying to weld around the camera and I couldn't really see it that well. 
but uh, you'll see when uh, when the uh, lens is lifted, it's, it's a pretty good result anyway. So it's pretty forgiving if you have have everything else set up right. See that looks familiar? Same technique. Just barely lift back into the puddle. Works on multi-pass welds as well as single-pass welds. Anything horizontal, overhead, flat. Another little tip tip for you: if you want to pick up your travel speed, don't overlap into the puddle and just uh, pause slightly at the top and uh, make a series of views not overlapping into the puddle at all, and you'll actually pick up your travel speed by about 50%. This particular part, sometimes I do about 20 of them, and they're about uh, one inch steel welded and a quarter inch uh, tubing, 18 inches long by about four inches, and I've got to weld them all the way around, and I'm looking for any way to get done I can, so that's a good tip for you. Thanks for watching. WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. Get a little bit of info. I'm going to start a little bit of a video. I'm going to show you about a half hour of work of it, but it covers a little bit of stick work. Today's school, we learned about closing the river.